This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FI Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics and that impact you, the viewer. Today, our guest is Anumita Roy Chaudhary. And I'm, I hope I pronounced it correctly, but if I did not, I do apologize. She's the Executive Director for the Center for Science and Environment in Delhi. She's in charge of sustainable urbanization that encompasses clean air, sustainability, and sustainable habitat. She has been awarded the Hagen Smith Clean Air Award by the California Air Resources Board. Uh, let me say this before I interview you. Thank you for all you're doing to make a difference. And climate change, I've written a lot, lot of, uh, uh, I'd say a lot of uh, articles and columns in the media and several other places about the, about the, um, about the climate change. It's, it's a critical race that we need to win. It should be high priority as I view climate change as a major threat to our economy, to who we are, to our health. So thank you for coming to show and let's get started. So Anomita, you. you are known to be a leading advocate in the developing world for clean air to breathe. What made you take up this unique campaign in the first place and how does the clean air affect our economy and our health? It's all your turn. Frank, you're so right, and I'm so happy you've asked me that question because often people ask me that how did the Right to Clean Air campaign at the Center for Science and Environment start? And I always say, sheer accident. It did not happen by design. And what happened was, imagine, about mid-90s in India when air pollution was already a problem, but there was very little awareness around it. And that was the time, suddenly, one... One, one afternoon, I still remember, the founder and director of the Center for Science and Environment, and I was still a young researcher at that point of time, he suddenly asked us to just go and find out that what is this problem of air pollution is all about? Because government is forcing us to take our cars to get the tailpipe emissions tested. So is that all that is needed to deal with the problem? So actually the whole work and today the big campaign around air pollution started with that one curious question that we investigated and then we found out that what had gone wrong. The fact that our industries were still lagging behind in emission control systems, the fact that vehicles were spewing so much of emissions because automobile industry and oil industry had not improved their technology and fuel quality, now, all that investigation that led to, I still remember, the first book that we did called, very provocatively called Slow Murder, The Deadly Story of Vehicular Pollution in India. And that had catalyzed the whole campaign for us. And you should know that at that point of time, when we were in quite a vacuum of information, there was so little science, so little information in the public domain, that even this little bit of information that we could distill and put out had become so powerful that it actually ended up catalyzing several developments around that time. It got the Supreme Court to walk, come in and take give slew of decisions. Government came up with white paper on air pollution and that had set a momentum going. And for us, it was no turning back from there. <laughs> That's a very well said. So is there anything in India like EPA is in the United States? So we do have our own EPA. Okay. So there's a Central Pollution Control Board. Yes. As we understand, you are an ex you are an executive director of the Center for Science and Environment in Delhi. Please tell our global viewer, and we got a lot of viewers, your organization is work, and how do you sustain yourself, and what does this uh, center do? You know, if I really try and talk about my organization. I would really need to locate it within the way environmental movement itself has evolved in India. So imagine when this institution was set up in 1980, you know, way back in 1980. And right? you have been there since 1980? No, no, not, not since 1980. I've been there since the 90s. Okay. And uh, so 
but that was a time when the you know the this visionary mr anil agarwal who was very noted environmentalist in uh, india and he had set it up and the essential attitude of the organization was that how do you challenge the established understanding of environment and development we really had to challenge the old school idea about conservation when it was when environment was understood as just about pretty trees and tigers and that you protect them and protect the forest and get people out of the forest but we challenged that we said in a developing world in global south we have to understand the intrinsic link between our natural resource base the livelihood and the development that needs to be dependent on very well sustained management of resources and therefore we cannot have this kind of guns and guard approach towards protecting natural resource so so the whole idea was to therefore come up with that what does environmentalism really mean in a developing country's context so that was the whole idea and that's when we also said that imagine that we are developing now and we are developing at a level of technology that is causing huge amount of pollution also and yet we need to be preventive we need to be precautionary our growth should not add to the pollution we need to leapfrog and we have to find a unique way of progressing because we have to be different from the global north because in us or europe you actually had 40 to 50 years to clean up everything right that and do, true. do your true. work incrementally but we have to do it as of, as if the deadline is yesterday Yeah, that's a good way to put it. You're working with Indian African Sea to help shape the roadmap for clean air action plan. How do you think are accepted the government officials for promoting policies to curtail air pollution in their countries and cities? Do you think African countries has a close to eight hundred eight hundred eighty thousand death, as you know, from the from the pollutions and as well as from the from the health official from the health official that's what i got the data and what can be done in africa to reduce air pollution we we'll we'll talk about africa not india first and we'll talk about india next okay so first about africa right so yes the challenge of africa and this is also part of the again the global south now so india is also a global south africa is also global south and yet africa's challenge is very different you know when you are so this is the time when africa is also growing its economy is growing but we know that they are also in the grip of pollution and when they have very little and the capacity death, and the death of uh, of the premature death absolutely from the, the lung number. and 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 from some lot of lot of disease they have exactly so air so therefore the disease burden related to air pollution is a right. huge and it's increasing but it's interesting to see like when we go to africa yes the capability is still, they really need lot more resources they need their capability but the receptivity in africa today is i would say is much better than what we had seen many years ago in our part of the world so you talk about north africa or the south africa or the middle africa or the west africa <laughs> do see changes you do see i mean there are differences still yeah. but we have seen more uh, more uh, 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 improvement and changes say for instance in the uh, the eastern african countries even south africa so uh, so there is a variation but what you see now just imagine you know i mean it's interesting to see that today the the african countries are talking about rapid electrification of their vehicle fleet right they are talking about decentralized renewable energy and they are moving ahead on that now but understand the nuanced uh, version of that so today africa is motorizing based on the dumped old vehicles from the other parts of the world so it is the used second hand vehicles that are invading the roads of africa and it is so tough for them therefore to work with internal combustion engine to meet the emission standards that we meet today So that they is are true. that is true but they're they poor the poor but then they are looking at the opportunity that how you can therefore leverage the electrification right. agenda and therefore you can uh, a side step the internal combustion engine paradigm and leave frog to a much cleaner future that's a good and, way to put it as you know the indian capital has been called the worst most polluted city and i have been there i went with obama to delhi on the republic day 
that was a pretty polluted day. And and we stayed for about a two days or one day. And then after that, he has to go to Saudi Arabia. So I, I flew back with him on Air Force One. So the question is that, so so this is the most polluted city in the world. And people are often, you know, scared of visiting Delhi in the winter time. Do you believe the local and national government in Delhi and India are subject to experts like you and action needed to fight air pollution for the sake of better health of its 20 million citizens? I did not realize that Delhi has a 20 million citizen. It's, it's like do another country. You, do you? Oh, that's a good way to put it. Well, it's, uh, Sudan has only about 4 million people. Do you know what really ails? Delhi, and do you know what the main causes of pollution is and the concerns of pollution in India is? Do you think that that it comes from the industry? It comes from the it comes from the rural areas? Tell us a little bit about the um, what are the concerns that affect the health of the people in India because of the pollution? Absolutely, Frank. And I would say that yes, Delhi is facing a very complex pollution challenge. And, yeah, and yet, what I would say, that this is a much more nuanced story for people to understand. It's not such a black and white to say that Delhi is polluted and Delhi is not doing anything about it. Because that's the kind of story that gets spawned all the time. So it's not but, industrial pollution in Delhi. It's the it's power. Mass, it's, it's also comes from the rural area as well, because they have to keep themselves warm in the winter. And also there's something about biomass. Burning for the burning for the cooking, right? Know. No, but let's put it this way first. Yes, pollution levels are high in Delhi, but let's first look at then what Delhi has done to deal with the problem. So okay. Delhi is also the only city in the country to have got rid of all diesel vehicles for public transport and local commercial transport, and it's gone completely to natural gas and now already achieved ten percent electrification. It has aligned with the Euro 6 emission standards. The, there are taxes on diesel so that there's an active policy to discourage use of diesel in Delhi. For the industrial use, they have banned coal, they have banned pet coke, furnace oil, and therefore natural gas has been scaled up. They have spaced out 10-year-old diesel vehicles and 15-year-old uh, petrol uh, the gasoline vehicles. Now, these are not small measures, and Delhi is also the only city that has shut down all its coal power plants. Now, none of these are small measures. And what is interesting, that because of this, now we are seeing that on year-on-year -year, year basis, the overall pollution levels in Delhi are coming down, and we have already seen a reduction of over 25%. Now, that is the good story. But, and that's where the challenge is, that even after that reduction, Delhi still needs to reduce its pollution by yet another 60% okay. to be able to be right. clean. And here, what we are finding, the major polluters today in Delhi are, in fact, 50% of the problem are actually vehicles. The sheer explosive number of vehicles in Delhi. And yes, you are right that the solid fuel that the poor people burn for That's cooking, right. is meat, but that is an equity issue. You know, so, uh, so that will require a different kind of a strategy to deal with them versus dealing with the vehicular pollution. So now the next generation action will have to be much harder. And for that to build the political and public support is really going to be the next big challenge. Well, the, 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 I think the part of the problem in Delhi, as I understand, is, is, is the pollution from the industry, from the rural area, but also the health of the people. It's affecting the health. The people have a lot more lung cancers. People have a lot more heart problems and heart disease and so on and so forth. And this has to be reduced because it, it, because one person's life is more precious than anybody else's life is, right? We have to we have to be concerned about it. Do you, do you see a brighter horizon for Delhi's pollution? I certainly do because if <laughs> with such struggle, because I am a diehard optimist. So oh, you and should I be optimist. See, yeah. Yes. And I have seen the change. Okay, it was, so everything that I've just talked about, you know, getting rid of the dirty fuel, getting the CNG, electric, I mean, this, all of these have been big battles and we have won that battle. So a lot of things have happened on ground. And if those have happened, there is no reason why more cannot happen. Yeah, but I agree with you. So how do you tell the people in the rural area to curtail it, to make sure they do the right thing? And what, do you, what incentive do you provide them to be more effective? 
So in the rural areas, the big problem here, absolutely right, is the use of solid fuel for cooking, right? right. right? Which increases exposure enormously, and right. that's a right. huge health risk. Now, the only way you can deal with it is with a clean energy transition. Now, the rural people, everyone should have access to uh, either gas or electricity for cooking and heating. Now, access and to reliable access and affordable access, those are the unique imperatives of the developing economy. And affordability is a big issue. Now, Government India does have a big program to give access to subsidized LPG to the rural people. But we have to understand that in India, poverty is of different levels. There are people who cannot also afford the subsidized LPG. That's a good way to put it. So we there are have, people who are rich also, very, very rich. Yes. So we really have to transfer, which is happening already, the subsidy from the rich to the poor, and that need to be done more effectively. And therefore, that's where we now, therefore, the polluter pay principle will really have to be applied more effectively now. So they are in the process of reducing greenhouse and gas emissions as well in, 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 in India. So that's to we do have our own uh, targets uh, for 2030 now. So as you know, that India has set its own target about reducing the uh, energy intensity of its economy by 45% by 2030. It is talking about reducing 1 billion ton of carbon. It, is a, a it, is, it has set a target of 50% of its energy from renewable sources. So we just have to be now on track and achieve that. Well, I hope they do achieve it. You see, so you see a brighter horizon for them. I certainly do, because try and understand the advantage that countries like India have. So, you know, because most of our development is in the future, and therefore we have a, have a choice to make. And if we make the right choices now, then we can prevent huge amount of pollution in the future. That's a good way to put it. Is there anything that Indian cities can learn from American cities? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, in fact- We had the same so problem back in the 60s in our country as well. No, but you know, where the good lesson is from the US uh, approach of dealing with the issue is the power of regulation. No. That's what you've seen in the US. And law and you order. Know, the, and the, the whole the way the regulations have been crafted for pollution control with very strong compliance framework, monitoring and measurable methods, right? And setting clear targets, making your funding uh, uh, performance linked. So in fact, from time to time, we have looked at several pieces of regulations in the US, in California. In fact, the diesel battle that we fought in Delhi, for that we actually had to draw upon what California did about declaring diesel as a toxic air contaminant and then taking action on it. And looking at the EPA, for instance, about how they do their air quality monitoring, air quality regulations, the Clean Air Act of the US, how they have made that more target oriented, performance linked. So there are a lot of lessons for us to, re to kind of strengthen our own regulatory framework for air quality management. And more we see this kind of learning, and if we can tap that learning curve and integrate some of those principles, you know, that can certainly drive the change. Well, that's a good way to put it. How far did COP28, which is the conference with parties that they concluded in Dubai, that was a, has something to do with the conference of um, the climate change conference in, in UAE, correct? Uh, you, you, which you attended, as I understand. And that's the reason we had a little bit of conflict in our scheduling of interviews. And I'm a pretty busy, a little bit busy, not that much busy as you are. <laughs> So do you think that the this will address the goals of sustainable organization and tell me how the agreements will be translated into implementation? You know, it was very exciting to see that this time in COP, there was such a strong where, spot. Where was this place? And so this was in Dubai. So in the, in so Dubai, the that's what I thought. What a beautiful city is Dubai. Dubai. It, yes. it makes the Manhattan look like a... Uh, you know, it, it it makes the Manhattan Manhattan looks like a what I consider you know pretty bad. <laughs> right, it looks so different. 
but uh, yes, no, but it was very interesting to be there. And uh, a lo lot of, uh, you know, there was quite a new energy this time in the conference right. of parties. Right. Uh, and, uh, and what I really liked is this very special spotlight on uh, urban agenda around climate change. Because, you know, just keep in mind that uh, the urban emissions are supposed to be about 70% of the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That is right? correct. Have to deal with our cities. So it was very interesting to see that how the mayors, the subnational governments, they all came together. Different countries came together. They signed on to the whole new urbanization uh, uh, agenda. And, the and that the countries were Asian, are the Americans, or the Europeans also? I mean, it's all across. It's all, it's across. all across. Okay. And they have also been able to get committed. Uh, some of the countries have also committed funds for it. And the, and what is exciting is that now a lot of the countries during the course of 2024 and 2025, they will be revising their nationally determined commitment on climate change. And with this new urban agenda, if that gets integrated, especially the mitigation plan, which will now be debated in the next COP, and if you look the at when the, the next COP will be, next COP so will, that, will occur where and when? Uh, so it's in the Azerbaijan. I think that's where they are. Uh, Azerbaijan. Okay. Yeah. I know so, where it is. Uh, so therefore, what they are saying is, uh, but the point is this, uh, already the, the whole urban agenda issues have got integrated with the text of mitigation. of. Uh, so if we can bring that in our national planning process, uh, it can really drive the change. And it is talking about how we need sustainable urbanization, sustainable mobility, how people travel and commute in the cities, how we do thermal comfort in our buildings to re reduce air conditioning, uh, how do we have heat action plans for cities. So that will really help to reduce and mitigate the urban emissions, keeping in mind that cities are both victim of uh, climate change all the extreme weather events, and they're also contributed to climate change. Yes, they, they do, they do. You're absolutely right. Is there anything else that you want to talk about before I close the conversation? I just want to say that, you know, it doesn't help to just talk about the doomsday. You know, we have to look at the opportunities for change. And That's I a feel good way to do that. that. That's a very well said. In a developing country like India, the opportunities, just look at it. Even when we are saying that the vehicle numbers are exploding, motorization is taking over, but yet the majority of Indians are still walking, cycling, and using public transport. That so is if, a true statement. So if and we poor, invest They're very in them, poor. Yes. So if we can invest in them, just imagine that you know we build on our own strength. And that is what we really want to showcase the world. Technology solution exists, policy solution exists, but I think the time has also now come for the mindset change, for people to bring change in their behavior, in their consumption, and reduce the overall intensity, the, uh, you know, the emission and the energy intensity uh, of the choices that we make and the roadmap that we really want to take forward. So, so opportunity exists. Now, how we leverage that how do we give a direction to that and have the leapfrog principle? We cannot be incremental about the change anymore. So that needs to be enabled. Do you have a, a lot of faith in the government that they can make it happen? I'm sure it's, it's never about us and them. I believe that if you're able to change the practice and the public opinion, the politics responds. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Anumita, for, for coming to our show. And this is Frank Islam, wishing you a great week. And thank you for watching.